Turn your Bible with me to the book of Acts chapter 1. We are studying the book of Acts chapter 1. And today we are, we will look into verse number 8. Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. For the reading of God's word, would you please stand. The Bible says here in verse number 8, But he shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. One more time. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and he shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Our dearest loving Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence this morning with the assurance that you love us very much. Please help us today, O oh God, that we may understand thy word. Help us, O oh God, make us bold and courageous as you want us to be, that we may become the light and salt of this world. Give us a receptive heart and an alert mind. Christ may be glorified. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, Jesus has, is resurrected. You know, he died for our sins. He was buried. And on the third day, as he promised, he rose again. Just as he promised, he rose again. And we see the evidences of his resurrection, the empty tomb. When Mary Magdalene and the apostles and the other Mary went to apply the balm on the body of Christ, Jesus, they saw that the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. And what they saw was they saw two young men who were actually angels who said, you search for Jesus of Nazareth. He's risen. He's not here. There was an empty tomb. The evidence of his resurrection. Not just the empty tomb, but an eyewitness. The eyewitness. Not just one person was an eyewitness, but more than 500 people. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible makes it very clear. About 500 people saw him, and they even saw when he was taken up, when he went up to heaven. They were like, for, Jesus was here on earth for 40 long, 40 days before he ascended up to heaven after his resurrection. So we see an empty tomb, we see the eyewitnesses, and then we see the encounter. Every individual that saw the resurrection of Christ, his life was transformed. We saw Peter. Peter, Peter was a fearful guy. He was afraid. He would not understand why this is going on. And he would be, uh, deny Christ. He denied Christ three times. As we know before Jesus was crucified. He was a fearful guy. But you know what we see? When he saw the resurrected Christ. And then as you see in Acts chapter 2. As we will see. 
in the coming days life of peter simon peter was transformed because of the encounter he had with the resurrected christ jesus now he is not standing anymore to deny that he has a relationship with christ but now he is standing to proclaim and receive 5000 people trusted jesus christ because of the boldness peter had in witnessing in preaching the resurrection of the lord jesus christ the next we see peter standing up again and preaching 3000 people trusted jesus christ and they were added into the church we see the life of apostle paul Apostle Paul was a murderer of Christianity. He destroyed Christian. He he destroyed the churches. He persecuted them. And in Acts chapter 9, we see on the road to Damascus, Apostle Paul uh, uh, saw as he was going with the permission of the high priest to kill every Christian and to destroy them. He saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. And what we see his life is now totally transformed now Saul is no more persecuting the christian but Paul is now proclaiming Christ all over the world he establishes churches goes on a missionary journey he is ready to die for Christ with the apostle as the history says that Peter who was a fearful guy is now so brave so courageous so bold and 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 as he sees what Christ has done in his life because of the truth he is now ready to die for Christ he was even crucified upside down apostle paul who was once upon a time uh, persecuting the christians and the churches is now ready and he has been taken to the prison several times and at the end of his ministry as he was in the prison waiting for his death He is not afraid of his death. He is saying, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And then we see his head was chopped off for proclaiming Christ. People say, preach Christ. You receive Christ. And if you become a good Christian, your life will be great. You will become rich. And you will have great bank balance and this and that. not be maybe we not be we see apostle paul's life prison poverty persecution standing for the truth we see the life of peter prison persecution poverty for preaching christ now that doesn't mean everybody will suffer and and be in poverty no the god says seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you yes god will provide on us yes god will take care of us yes god will protect us but christianity is not about riches and prosperity it is about proclaiming christ and following christ and living in christ and living for christ that is what christianity is all about we see john Apostle John who was in the Isles of Patmos he was put in a prison in that island of Patmos you know what we see as we read in history he died an old age life death at the age of 95 but what we see is this man was dipped in a boiling oil for being a follower of being a disciple of Christ for being a Christian he was dipped in the oil but miraculously he was healed and, and then he he was the only apostle who died a normal old age death so when you see the life of all the apostles we see they died under torture and a great persecution why why would this man would hazard their life for Christ because they knew that Jesus Christ is the truth they knew there is no truth there's no salvation there's no peace and uh, only Christ is the answer for life 
Only Christ is the truth. Only Christ is the life. Only Christ is the way. And they were willing to put all on the altar for Christ. They were not afraid. Encounter with Jesus changed their life completely. They were even willing to die. Empty tomb, I witnessed an encounter with Christ. And God expects today you and me to have the same power what he promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. What transformed the life of the apostles and the early Christians. God expects that you and I have such. Brother, you're a Christian? Oh, brother, yeah. I got saved in a Baptist church. You got baptized? Oh, yeah. Pastor Lawson baptized me. So do you witness now? Really? I should witness? Why? Why are we afraid? Why are we afraid to tell somebody about Christ? Why are we afraid to testify about Christ? The problem is, we have not waited upon the Lord for His power. We are not desiring to be filled with the Spirit of God on a daily basis. Christian life is an amazing life, dear friends. But it's not just accepting Christ, receiving Him, getting baptized, and coming to church on Sunday. That's not Christianity. That is a part of Christianity. But that is not all about our Christian life. That's much more than that. It's living a fulfilled life. Living a complete life. You know what Christ said? I am come to give you life and life in abundance. How many of, we, uh, of you here can say, I'm living a life, complete life, fulfilled life, filled life, a life of abundance? I'm not talking about if you have enough food on your table. I'm not talking about you have LIC for your health and for your car and for your house. I'm not talking about if you have lots of bank balance that for the next two years, even without working, you can still survive. No, I'm not talking about that. That's not abundant life. That's not fulfilled life. Some of the richest men in this world, in this earth, who have so much of money, are not living a fulfilled life. Living with fear, living with uh, pain, living with... Um, uh, they're afraid that this will happen and that will happen and, and uh, come... They are uh, piling up things. Tomorrow I don't know what will happen to my children. I need to buy this property. I need to put up so much money for my children. And it's all about money, property, saving, insurance. And we think that is what life is. And we change our Christian life into material. But when we have so much for ourselves, I, me, myself, and my family, we always live in fear. The government will come, in, come to know about it. I need to manipulate this so that I don't pay so much tax. I need to manipulate here. I need to manipulate there. I need to bring a chartered accountant in such a way that he'll help me to manipulate the government. They try to hide things here. Living in fear. And then we are afraid of uh, what if people will come to know about this. I need to live in such a way that nobody understands that I'm rich. And then we are thinking that everything is a fulfilled life and we are actually living a fear within. But the apostles, look at the apostles. They were brave and courageous. Bold. I mean, being in a prison, a man can say, I rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. What in the world can such a man say that he is rejoicing when he is in the prison? I'll tell you what it is. That's a man who is living a fulfilled life. Who have experienced the joy of living for Christ. Who have experienced the completeness of living an abundant life for Christ. Why? Because they desired every day to have the power of God upon them. They were not thinking about how I can 
please my neighbor, how I can uh, 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 please my neighbor by not offending him by the truth, so I can decorate uh, my lifestyle in a, such a way that he is okay with me. And he doesn't think that my Christian life is offensive, so let me decorate myself and my lifestyle so that he is happy or she is happy. Because I am afraid that they will think I'm a Christian. And we live this fearful life every day. And we don't want anybody to think about, Oh, what if they think I'm a Christian? What if they come to know about my testimony? So I will not tell anybody. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is a hope for every Christian here. It gave a, a boost to our Christianity, to our, for our Christian life. A life that we can enjoy in the presence of God daily with power. Every Christian should live a fulfilled life. Imagine if every member right now, every individual right now in this room is living a fulfilled life. What a difference it will make. We don't need thousands of Christians to make a difference. We just need 11 individuals who are totally sold out for Christ. Eleven individuals totally sold out for Christ. You know what the Bible says? When you read the Bible, it talks about this eleven guy. The Bible says they turned the world upside down. How many of them turned the world upside down? Just 11. Just 11. You know, Christ was a willing to invest his whole life upon this to 11 fellows. And one guy turned to be a devil from the 12, Judas Iscariot. But this 11 guy, he invested his time, his energy, his knowledge, his power, his everything upon these people and you know what happened to them now these guys became bold why did they become that way because they walked with Christ they lived with Christ they learned of Christ they longed for Christ and now they applied the truth in their life of Christ and they lived out for Christ Guys, the Bible says they turn the world upside down. Just 11 guys. Just 11. We don't need thousands of Christians coming out on the road to show the majority. We just need 11 persons, 11 individuals who is living for the Lord, is honest and sincere, loving God, loving his neighbor, praying for his neighbor, no matter what religion he is, but he's willing to pray for him that God would touch his heart and turn this world upside down. Praying for our neighbors is loving our neighbors. Lord, I want my neighbor. This man is this religion. That man is that. I pray that thou will bless my neighbor, O oh God, that he will, his eyes will be open, his heart will be open, that his ears will be open to the truth, and he will be, he will be convicted of the truth, and he will trust in the truth. Praying for our neighbor. These people, this, this apostle's life was transformed. But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You know what was happening over here? These people were with Jesus Christ. And Jesus has promised in, verse, in John chapter 14, 15 and 16, It is expedient for me to go. And if I go, I will send you another comforter. Right? He speaks about the Holy Spirit that is going to come when Jesus Christ physically will be ex uh, uh, taken up to heaven. And he says spiritually, he'll come in the form of the Holy Spirit. And they, oh, he will send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of God, to come upon every individual who will put his trust in Jesus Christ. And so, as he promised, Jesus is saying, reminding them one more time before he goes up. He says, wait. You shall receive power. 
Because without the power, you cannot live a complete life. Without the power, you cannot influence the life of others. Without the power of God, nothing can be done. You can just boast that you are a Christian, you are saved by the blood of the Lamb, and all this thing, you can say the right thing, but you cannot live, with, live a life of fulfillment without the power of God. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Many a time, Baptists are afraid to preach about the Holy Spirit. Because we are afraid, oh, if I preach about the Holy Spirit, the Pentecostals, the Charismatics will think we are also Pentecostals. No. The, Baptist, the, the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit was taught by Bible-believing Christians right from Acts chapter 1. It is the Baptists who always preach the truth. But recently, in, the new, in, in these uh, recent days and age, Baptists are afraid to preach about the Holy Spirit because they are afraid that we will have a tag that we are also charismatic of Pentecostals. It's not about the Pentecostals and charismatic, it's about the Bible. And we all need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, just as Jesus said. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. You see? You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. When was the last time you really experienced? When was the last time you really experienced the power of God upon you? When was the last time you really knew that you were filled by the Holy Spirit? When was the last time that you knew that only God, that, that you need to wait upon the Lord for the power of God in your life? When was the last time? When you read the Bible, we see in the Bible that we need to wait upon the Lord. We need to be filled by the Holy Spirit. But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And he shall be witnesses both. Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. If we want to become a successful Christian, to be a witness all over the world, if we want to send out the fragrance of this Christ into the world, to our neighbors, to our families, then we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled by the Holy Spirit of God. Many a times, dear friend, we are just satisfied by the gospel, we are just satisfied that we are saved, and we are not moving ahead to live a fulfilled life. Every Christian should long for the filling of the Holy Spirit in day-to-day -day life. Every Christian. Why we need the power? Why should you and I need the power? The Bible tells us that we need power to witness. If I don't have the power, I'm not going to witness to anybody. In the last 10 days, if you have not witnessed to anybody about Christ, you know why? Because you don't have power. Except the truth. No offense about it. Because if you had the power of God, you would have witnessed to somebody. I'm not putting words extra here. The Bible says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. To become a witness, you and I need power power of the Holy Spirit. It's not speaking about going to the gym and, and doing work hard and have this muscle power. No, no, no. no. This is courage, boldness, the power of the Holy Ghost when He will come on you. You can look like a Humpty Dumpty, but yet you will have the power of God. Or you can look like Supandi, the skinful fellow, and yet you will have the power of God. Amen? 
but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost. So, you will receive the power when the Holy Ghost will come upon you. It's not speaking about coming in you. The Holy Ghost comes in you when you receive Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost comes upon you every time you call upon Him. Coming upon you is to clothe you. Coming upon you is to control your life. Coming upon you is to feel you. That he holds the stirring of your life in leading you and guiding you and making you bold and you become a witness for Christ all over the world, wherever you are. I get phone calls for, from Kashmir. Muslims keep giving me call, phone calls. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I want to know more about Jesus Christ. Can you come to Kashmir? What they want to do? They want to kill me. I'm serious. They want to kill me. You go to the website of the RSS, they have my videos on it. They want to kill me. They have me. They're watching my life. I'm not afraid. And I tell them, why don't you come to Goa? Let's have a cup of tea here and I'll share the gospel. No. Can you come up there? I said, why don't you go and meet some pastors? They will. No, nobody knows the truth. Only you know the truth. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And put a knife to my throat. But you shall receive power. We need the power of the Holy Ghost every day, dear friend. Power to witness. Power to witness. Are you afraid of dying? Are you afraid somebody will hurt you? Don't be afraid of someone that will kill your flesh. Afraid of the one that will send your soul and your body to hell. And if you are saved, we have nothing to lose, my friend. We have everything to gain. And Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As Christians, we have nothing to lose. There's nothing to lose. But if I die now, who will enjoy all the money I piled up? That's the problem with us. That is the problem with us. If I die now, what about all those properties that I have? That's the problem with us. We hold up, store up everything, not for Christ, but for Antichrist. That's why we will not witness. That's why Christians will not ask for the Holy Spirit power. Because if the Holy Spirit comes upon you and He will give you the power to witness, then you'll start hating all this material thing and you'll become bold for Christ. But you don't want to. We need witness. We need power to witness. Every Christian should ask God, Lord, I need the power to witness. See what the Bible says. But you shall receive the power after, the whole, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Both in Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is your family. Inside your house. That's Jerusalem. You begin to win your husband. You begin to win your wife. You begin to win your children. You begin to win the members in your family. Because that's your Jerusalem. God gives you the power. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you. So you could witness to your Jerusalem. Your family. You know we named our first son as Israel, and my wife was pregnant, and then the second son was born, 
and the doctor, when my son, second son was born, my doc, the doctor picked him up and said, and gave him a head and t took, it, took him to my wife and said, Grace, here's your Jerusalem. <laughs> no, we had named him Stephen, actually. But he thought Jerusalem would be good. And that is true. What he said was right. Your family is your Jerusalem. Your husband, your wife, your children, that's your Jerusalem. Lord, I need this boldness. I need the power of the Holy Ghost to come upon me so I can be a witness in my Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. I can't witness to my wife. If I tell her about Christ, she'll show me the knife. Then ask for the power. I can't witness to my husband. If I begin to witness to my husband, he'll start fighting. Then ask daily to God for the power of the Holy Ghost. Because here is the promise. Can you believe the promise of Christ today? And he said, you will receive power. So every day we should ask God, Lord, give me the power of the Holy Ghost. That I can be a witness to my Jerusalem. That I can witness to my son. I can witness to my daughter. I can witness to my wife. I can witness to my husband. That's your Jerusalem. That is not just putting, uh, putting up there just, just the name. It's not about just the name. So that, that doesn't mean, oh, now I became a Christian. I need a plane ticket to go to Jerusalem to witness. No. Your Jerusalem is your family. Some people get, to get saved just so that they can go to Jerusalem to witness. Some of my students are starting to have burden for America. I want to go to America and preach. Why, brother? Souls are dying here, going to hell. Why don't you get, go out and work for people? So Jerusalem is your family. Every day you should pray for your husband. Every day you should pray for your wife if she is not saved. If he is not saved. Every day you should pray for your children if she's not saved. My children are not perfect. My children are not saved. But every day I make it a point that when we pray, I and my wife, we pray, God, please have mercy upon us and save our children in a very young age. That will be a blessing when our children will grow up to 6, 7, 8 and they get saved. What a blessing it will be. We should start praying for our children now. Everyone. What's his name? What's this little fellow's name? Huh? Lizzo. And what is this guy's name? I like your hairstyle. <laughs> and if we would just start praying for these little fellows every day, every day, I'll tell you, when we pour the prayer upon our children, God will begin to work in their heart. Amen? They will grow. They will grow to understand Christ and understand the truth. Because they are our Jerusalem. We don't want the devil to get our children when they grow up. They are our Jerusalem. We need the power to witness to our Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is our family. Then Judah. Judea. He shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. In all Judea, speaking about our extended families, our cousins, uncle, auntie, grandfather, grandmother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, first cousin, second cousin, third cousin. All our families. Now God is not saying win everyone. Of course we need to win. But God is speaking about witnessing. Not that everyone to whom you witness will come to Christ, but you should witness anyway. Winning someone to Christ is the work of the Lord. He will save. You and I cannot save. Christ will save them. But you and I should witness to them. Amen? Amen. How can I witness, brother? Go and talk to them. 
How can I witness, sister? Invite them to the church so they will hear the gospel. How can I witness? Why don't you write an email or a text message? But the best thing I'll tell you is write a card. Sending a card is always a special. Writing, taking a paper and writing to them how you pray and how much you love them how much you care and all this thing and you pray for them daily and this is what you have um, you, 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 what Christ has done in your life and this is what you desire for them and you write a letter to them not email, write a letter handwritten because they are special and you write letters to people of your family send them Christmas cards, send them Easter cards, send them birthday cards, send them wedding anniversary cards, send them uh, something, make it special and let them know, witness in whichever way possible because that's your duty dear friend it's our responsibility which we should consider it's the privilege of every Christian And that's what God wants us to do, to witness. We need to cover up all our members of our family, our cousins. Or what? Invite them, have a family time, invite them to your home for a lunch one night, one day, or a dinner for a day, or sometimes have a special uh, gathering, a family union. Bring them together and why don't you tell them, today we have a special meeting. Or use the birthday celebration of your child or of your anniversary of your, cup, of your wife, you know, husband and wife anniversary. Invite your families, cook good food for them and bring your pastor and have a good, uh, beautiful talk and, and, and ask him to give a short gospel message. Witness in whichever way possible. A Christian should be a witnessing Christian, dear friend. Every individual should have a ministry today. Every wife, every husband, every child should have a ministry. And we can do a great ministry. We don't need a pulpit. Wherever you stand can be a pulpit. Amen? Amen. I can still have a preaching ministry. By keeping my pulpit here and I can stand here and I'm still preaching. I can stand down there and talk to somebody and I will still be preaching. What I try is witnessing to people. I say, hey brother, I want to take you for lunch. And I want to talk to you about what Christ has done in my life. And I invite them for a cup of tea. And mostly I will take them for lunch. And then I will sit with them during lunch and I will pray with them and I will share the gospel to them. And I'll tell them about what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And I'll t and, and share the gospel to them. And many of them, I won them to the Lord. Some I have not, but I've witnessed to them about the Lord. And we should be a witness. In whichever way possible, we should witness, my dear friends. Use every possible idea to witness. Maybe it's a wedding anniversary, birthday celebration, Christmas, New Year, Easter. Whatever it is. Witness to your family. Because this kind of celebrations will bring your families together. When you say, come, we have a celebration. And they will all come. Well, let's have dinner tonight. And they will all come. Then invite somebody. Maybe your pastor. Or if you can do a better job, do it anyway. You can sometimes you could be better than your pastor in witnessing somebody. And God gives such gifts to people in the church. Do it anyway. So Jerusalem is your family. Judea is your cousins. Uncle, auntie, brothers, sisters, cousins, grandfather, mother-in-law, father-in-law, grandmother. Then Samaria. The Bible says, and in all Judea and in Samaria. What is Samaria? Samaria. Samaria means your enemies. Whom you think, oh no. I don't know, they don't look like, come on. You don't know what they did to me. Because that's what happened. John chapter 4, Jesus went to the Samaritan woman, right? In Samaria. She came one day 
one lady was going to get married and uh, she went to the printer and she told the printer printer please uh, put 1 John chapter 4 verse 18 on my wedding card perfect love casteth out all fear and she said I want to have this on my wedding card and so printer said okay this guy was not a Christian so what the printer did was while he was printing the wedding card he forgot to put one John he just put John chapter 4 verse 18 you have five husband and the one that you're leaving is not your husband <laughs> I was a mess of the wedding card and so Jesus ran to this lady who was actually having five husbands and the one she's living with is not her husband right now but the Jewish people considered them as untouchable and enemies and wicked people and dirty people and they never would go through that road they would never drink water with them they will never talk to them and they will just ignore all this but you know what Jesus did he said hey everyone has a hope and I'm here to save you see salvation is not in a Pope salvation is in Jesus Christ Amen. your hope is not in a Pope nor in a dope only in Christ Jesus only in Christ Jesus. And Christ will come and love everybody. No matter what religion an individual is. No matter what circumstances an individual is going through. No matter what position a person is. Whether he's rich or poor, sad or thin, young or old, or, or whatever, sick or healthy. Christ loves everybody. He died for all. He wants to embrace everybody. And so he goes to this lady who thought nobody loves her anymore. She came to a place, to, she came at the time when nobody comes to the well. Because if she would come to the well, during when the other ladies would come, they would be gossiping, mocking at her. So she knew, the sixth hour, nobody comes, let me go to get some water at that time. Christ comes to anybody and everybody who thinks they are rejected by the world. He comes to that person bringing the love and saying, you are rejected by the world, I'm here to accept you. Wow, what a great God we serve. When you are rejected by the world, Christ comes and says, you are accepted. Isn't that amazing? Ephesians chapter 1, you are, before, you, know, you are blessed with all the spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You are accepted, adopted, you are redeemed, you are forgiven, you are beloved in Christ. Samaria may be our enemies and once we are Christians we forgive our enemies and we pray that God would change their heart and forgive them and save them that's Christianity I know it's hard sometimes but Christ set us free he said unless and until you are able to go through Samaria you cannot enter the whole world before you go to the whole world, you need to get right with Samaria. Wow. We need power. So Samaria is your enemies. And then he says, at most parts of the world. All over the world. We need power to win my family, to win our cousins, our, our relatives, our enemies, and all over the world. We need power to be a testimony, dear friend. We need a power to be a testimony. You know, when you read the book of Acts, we read, every time persecution or opposition came, they did not say, Lord, take away the persecution from us. They said, Lord, give us, give us boldness and courage that we may proclaim your word. When put, Peter, was, Peter was caught and put in prison, the church prayed, and you know what they prayed for? The Bible says they prayed for power. They prayed for boldness and courage to proclaim the word of God. Wow. You pray for testimony, to be a witness in testimony. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I think after reading this we are finishing. Ephesians chapter 5.
Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine. Okay? Be not drunk with wine. Don't drink. Christians, don't drink. But how about little? No. First drop is leading you to drunkenness. So don't drink. Okay? Because that will lead you to sin. So God says, I'm not saying God says, and be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess. Wherein, in, wherein is excess means that which will lead you to drunkenness. Some people say, God is telling me to drink little. It's just that I should not drink more. Now that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, and be not drunk with wine. Comma, don't drink. Wherein in excess means that is what will lead you to drunkenness. Get it? But be filled with the Spirit. Why? He is contradicting. He is bringing this contrast. He is saying, drinking wine and filling of the Holy Spirit. Because when you drink alcohol, the alcohol controls you. Right? The alcohol controls you. I know, I have one, my uncle, and he drinks. And uh, I remember still, when I was a kid, he would drink, and he would not know what to talk. And you know, after he is drunk, all that he would say is, mosquito is mosquito. <laughs> mosquito is mosquito. I know mosquito is mosquito. But he would say that when he is drunk, mosquito is mosquito. That's what drunkenness does. And then you see some people drink. You know, we have, if you see, if you come to the Bible college, we have given shelter to one, one guy. And he's sitting, he's sleeping there, we give him bed, we give him food, taking care of this guy. But once upon a time, he was holding a government job. And lots of money, lots of property. But you know what he would do? He would drink every day. And every day he would drink and come and fall at a house near the roadside. And he would make fun, he would give bad words and this and that. And now he is so skinny. His family doesn't want him. His family is well to do in Goa. They are well to do. Nobody wants him. And he lives there in the Bible college. We are taking care of him. What made him like that? Drunkenness. He is so skinny now. Drinking made a mess of one man's life. And so God is saying, alcohol will make your life like this. And he says, no, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Man. This is going to give you fulfillment in life. But I want a great kick, man. Then be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and see, you'll go so far, like football kick. I mean, you'll really live a fulfilled life. A spiritual Christian is a happy Christian. He's a satisfied Christian. Is a joyful Christian. Amazing. See what the Bible says. But be filled with the Spirit of God. Filled with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit controlling your life. It's like when you are driving the car, you put your hand on the steering and you are controlling, right? That's what happened. When the Holy Spirit fills you, the Holy Spirit controls you. So filling means controlling you. The Holy Spirit controls your thoughts, He controls your direction, controls your life. He helps you to make proper decisions, that whom you should marry, uh, what kind, of, uh, how you should be, what kind of a Christian you should be, and what the proper decision you should take. The Holy Spirit helps you to make decisions. And when you can't pray, wow, I like that, Romans chapter 8, He prays on behalf of you, intercedes through groaning. That's what the Holy Spirit does when you're, Holy, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And how do you know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? See what happened. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you know this. You're not going to uh, say, uh, you know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you pray and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to go and start uh, saying, uh, okay, 
I, I think I should not. The Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. If you want to find a spiritual Christian, he'll be singing. She'll be singing. She'll be joyful. She will come to church and she'll be singing. He will come to church and he'll be singing. He will be in the kitchen, she will be in the kitchen, they'll be singing. They'll be encouraging themselves. A spiritual Christian is a joyful Christian. Look at that. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You're going to be happy. Have you seen Christians? Give me that book. Have you seen Christians coming to church? Please turn your hymn books to uh, uh, let us sing hymn number 257. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And the song leaders start. Singing is going on. This guy is singing. You know what? No spirit. Not fear. Not filled. I know it's funny, but it's sad. It is sad. Pastor, you're talking about me, right? Yes, brother. I am talking about you. Why don't you repent today and get right with God and ask Him to fill you with His Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. But the same fellows, the same people who cannot sing God's word. You know, you'll find them out on the road. They have these earphones in their head. And they're singing pretty spear and what is that? What is that fellow? Who needs a haircut? Justin Barber? I was in Orissa. I could not find my brush, hair brush. I told Carlton, can you give me a hair brush? He took his cap and said, Pastor, you're making fun of me. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> Christians are spending more time in worldly music than singing and praising God because they are not concerned about their spirit. They are not wanting God to fill them with the spirit. They cannot sing. A spiritual Christian is a singing Christian. Pastor, but I don't have a good piece to sing. I cannot sing, Amazing grace, how sweet. I cannot sing. When I sing, Amazing grace, man, you sing. God will tune his ears in proper pitch. God wants to see your heart, not your pitch. Amen? Amen. Just sing. A spiritual Christian will be a singing Christian. A joyful Christian, he'll be always, she will be always singing. Wow. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, so a spiritual Christian is a singing Christian. Always singing and happy. Verse number two. You're not singing for yourself, dear friend. Remember, a spiritual Christian never sings for yourself. Uh, everybody should say, I'm singing good. No, no, no. It is unto the Lord. <laughs> right? So even if your peach is not right, don't worry. In heaven, everything is proper. So sing anyway. It's because it's for the Lord. Amen? Amen. One day, a group of people got together and they were practicing for choir and... And there was a guy who could not sing properly. He was singing so loud and everything. He was ruining the choir. And so the choir leader went to pastor and said, Pastor, that fellow is ruining. Can you go and talk to him uh, that he should not join the choir and that he can do something else? So the pastor wanted to be very nice and kind. So the pastor went to this guy and said, Hey, brother, um, I know you're doing a great job and you can do so many on this thing. Um, just a couple of people have just come and told me that um, you're very good in this work, but you cannot sing properly. So if you don't mind, can you just uh, get out of the choir? Because people told uh, you're not good in singing. And so this guy said, Pastor, 
I know you think you're preaching good. Many of the people told me that you cannot preach. <laughs> so that is how it is. But you know what, my dear friend? It is not to yourself. It is unto the Lord. Amen? You preach unto, you sing unto the Lord. You preach for the Lord. A joyful Christian is not concerning about how people will praise me. He's concerned about how we can praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Secondly, what, you, how, what a, joy, a spiritual Christian is, is giving thanks always. He's a thankful Christian. Always thankful. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. All things. Unto God and the Father. You see that? Unto God and the Father. God and the Father. Speaking about Jesus Christ as God. God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, a spiritual Christian is a singing Christian and is a thankful Christian. Okay? 21. Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of the Lord. You see? Submitting yourself one to another. That means, many a time we like to say, husband, love your wife. Wife, submit your husband, okay? But yeah, that is true. You know, I remember one day I was preaching about how a wife should submit to her husband and I had a guy sitting right on the third row from Korea and he was like elbowing his wife, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I told husband, love your wife as Christ loves her and she said, listen, listen. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and so, submitting yourself, like each one, husband submitting, sometimes wife has great ideas and you know, suggestions to give. Okay, but you're supposed to be the final decision maker. Don't become like Adam listening to Eve and eating that fruit. Or don't listen, don't become like Abraham listening to Sarah and going to Hagar, causing problem for the whole world. Because of Abraham and Hagar's wrong, uh, um, uh, Sarah's wrong decision, Israel is still fighting with Palestine. Don't do that. Don't start another word, buddy. <laughs> Just... Make a choice, proper choice. Okay? Now, why, there are so many good things a woman can do. And sometimes they are better than hers in certain areas. And there we submit to it. And husband, you're always the leader. And wife should always submit to the husband. That's what the Bible says. You don't like it, go fight with God. I cannot tolerate that. Okay? Just fight with God if you can. But no, you just, this is what the Bible tells us. Submitting yourselves one to another. How wonderful the family will be. There will be a great harmony, right? If each one considers each one better than us. Like, my wife knows how to cook. I don't have to teach her how to cook. You better be careful. The ladies knows when to put extra salt to ruin your food. <laughs> so don't give some suggestion where you are not good enough to do it. Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Fear God. Okay, the wife should submit to her husband because, not because people are watching, it's because you love God. Amen? Amen. And husband, the Bible says you should also submit. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then verse 22 explains, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. As unto the Lord. Not to any man, but to your own husband. Okay? If any man else comes and tells you what to do, he said, forget about it. Get out, man. I'll listen to only my husband. Amen? Amen. You're supposed to listen to your, or submit to your own husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This is another message. But I'm just sticking to the filling of the Holy Spirit. A spiritual Christian is a joyful Christian, is a thankful Christian and a submitting Christian. You're submitting one to another. Every Christian comes, church members will submit to Christ, and you will submit to the authority that Christ has put upon. Maybe a pastor. So he will become your leader, leading you to the right path, helping you to understand the scriptures, and helping you to walk with the Lord. And unless and until you submit to that leadership that Christ has put upon you, then there will be confusion. That's why we need to submit. The church will submit to the pastor. Hebrews chapter 13, read, to the, read in that. Let us submit to our elders who has rule over you 
okay? Then you should submit to your boss in your job place. Children should submit to the mother and to the father. Wives should submit to the husband. There's always submission. You know why the problem in the world is Satan never wanted the authority. That's why he rebelled against God. Rebellion comes when you don't want to submit to the authority. Everything started from there. People don't like to submit because that's the work of the devil. Christians should learn to submit to your authority. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So now we have established this. We are saying, okay, as a Christian, I need to have the power of the Holy Ghost upon me so that I can be a witness to my family, to my cousins, to my enemies, and to my all over the world. Okay, and that I can be a good testimony. How? By being joyful, by giving thanks, and by being submissive. Now, how can I be filled? The Bible says, confess your sins unto God. You know your sins? The Bible says, my little children, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, sin not. And if you sin, we have an ad advocate with the Father. And we, we, we have a righteous judge. And we, let, let's read 1 John chapter One John chapter uh, one verse number nine, verse number eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. You know what God does? He will forgive us from all our sin, all our unrighteousness. The first step to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, we need to confess our sins. Get right with God. Once you confess your sin, then you ask. Then you ask. You know what the Lord says? You know what the Lord says? Ask and it shall be given unto you. You know in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Luke we read, the Bible says, if a son asks the father for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? No. If a son asks for the father for the bread, will he give him a stone? No. If a son asks for the, to the father for a fish, will he give him a snake? Huh? No. So if the father who is evil know how to give good gifts to the son, how much more the father in heaven will give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Amen. It is the matter of just confessing your sin and asking God every morning when you wake up, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I need you to guide me and lead me today. It's that simple, dear friend. Actually, Christian life is not hard. We make it hard. It is so simple. You trust in Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. Then what? It's a simple lifestyle. Just enjoying Him. Christian life is enjoying Christ, not about you and me. It's about Him. All I want to please Him. So I'm going to do what the Bible says, what I should do. It's a beautiful life. Religion will make your life difficult and hard. Only Christ will make it easy, simple. That's why He said, All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, for my yoke is easy. Amen? Christian life is easy. You just have to go and ask. Like a child will go and ask the father. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I know I, I just messed up yesterday. Please forgive me. I'm sincerely sorry. I don't want to do that. I did it, but I'm sorry for it. Please forgive me. And then when you ask God for forgiveness, you go to him and say, Lord, without the power of the Holy Ghost in my life, I cannot do anything. I need your power. Fill me with your spirit, O oh God. Fill me today and lead me and guide me and help me to bring glory and honor to your name. When you ask him, you put joy in his life. You put smile on the face of God. And God says, wow, I'm going to bless my son. I'm going to bless my daughter today. He gives it freely. You don't have to work for it. It's a gift of God. So filling of the Holy Spirit is a regular thing. And you ask God to fill you on a regular basis. And every morning is the most important prayer that you can pray. Because the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. Amen? Amen. And then when you pray and ask God, 
you need to believe. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Don't doubt. When you ask God, then believe. After receiving the Holy Spirit, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, don't expect will happen in your life. No, nothing will happen. You'll just feel, you just believe. I prayed. I believe. God said, if I would ask, He will give me. Amen? Amen. Just take His word and believe that I asked, so God will give me. Lord, I thank you that you filled me with your, with your spirit. Lead me and guide me in Jesus' name. That's what God says. You know what the Bible says? But he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you become a witness. You become a testimony. You become a spiritual Christian. Amen. Amen. Today, why not we use this opportunity to ask God to fill us with His Spirit? A few moments in silence. Maybe while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit spoke to you and the Holy Spirit reminded you of certain sins that is in your life that you need to ask God for forgiveness. And ask God to forgive your sin. And after you ask God to forgive your sin, ask the Lord to fill you with the Spirit. Say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit today. And make me powerful, courageous, and bold. And after you pray, believe that you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Faith pleases God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen? Shall we go in prayer right now?